Well, let's all stand today, and we're going to go to the Word of God this morning. We're going to be back in Daniel this morning in the fifth chapter and looking at the, uh, some verses that we've already read over previously when Daniel had last time interpreted that of, of the handwriting that was on the wall. And uh, before we move on into the sixth chapter and we speak about how the, the kingdom of Babylon was overthrown, uh, Darius would be set up as king now as far as when we speak about the, uh, uh, the, that of the, the Persian Empire and how that they would come and certainly take over that of Babylon. But I wanted to point out a few things when we talk about Belshazzar. And we know that his, his heart had been lifted up in pride. That's what uh, he is clear on. And we see that he was, he was trusting in that uh, of these, these idols. And, and I want to point that out today because uh, I didn't have much time last week to, to elaborate on it. And I, I'd like to go back to it one more time. We're going to be in chapter 5 of the book of Daniel looking at verse 22. Daniel has been called before the uh, king. He has given him a, uh, a short history of that of his uh, ancestors and how God had worked on their behalf, what God had done to them and for them. And now he comes and says to Belshazzar, and that's where we pick it up in verse 22. He says, but you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart Although you knew all this, and you have lifted up yourself, and you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven, they have brought the vessels of the house, of his house, before you, and you, and your lords, your wives, and your concubines, and have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone which do not see, or hear, or know, and the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways, you have not glorified. Then the fingers of the hand were sent from him, and this writing was written. And this is the inscription that was written, Mini Mini Tikal Eupharsin. This is the interpretation of each word. Mini. God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Paris, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a chain of gold around his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. Father, we thank you once again for the great work of your word. Lord, we thank you for that day when the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And Lord, we just praise your holy name for the work that your word does. That in the very beginning, you spoke the word and said, let there be light. And there was light. We thank you, God, that your word changes hearts. That, Lord, it regenerates the lost. That it sanctifies the believer. And we look to you today, Lord, to use your word as it goes forth. That it would accomplish its purpose of which you sent it forth to do. So bless, Lord, now the reading, the hearing, and the preaching of your word. And again, all glory and honor be yours. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We looked today at uh, these few verses and noted that we covered last week about the interpretation of the handwriting on the wall. And it was, a, it was very direct, and it was directed right at that of Belshazzar, who was then that of the king. He was the, the reigning king uh, of Babylon. 
And we know that is that is the Lord had spoken very clearly through the handwriting on the wall that we see that the days of Belshazzar were numbered. He had been found in the hanging of balance. Those heavenly scales had been tipped and that his kingdom would be taken from him. And it would be very quickly. And just as the Bible tells us that it happened just in a night that we, we know that in, just in that moment that it, it just, he was swept away. Uh, he had died that evening, and then Darius, the king of the Medes, was put into that position of the reigning king. Now note that when we go back and we look at, at what Belshazzar, why God himself had, had come before Belshazzar to take the kingdom away, we note that as Daniel says, but you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart. So he had all that background of which we had looked at last week of his grandfather, father, all that had gone on in the past, all these things that Belshazzar knew. But Belshazzar would not give God the glory of which he was worthy of. He should have glorified the God of the one true living God and not clung to all these other gods. That's when he says, you have lifted up yourself, although you knew that there was a, a true God who has done these amazing things on your behalf and on behalf of your ancestors, you would still not honor him as the one true God. He says, and you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. So note that not only would Belshazzar not humble himself, but he would also, as Daniel said, you have lifted yourself up against that he would become an enemy, even though he was an enemy towards God. But now he would truly display himself as an enemy towards God. And how is this? He says that they have brought the vessels of his house, meaning God's house. Because Nebuchadnezzar, when he overthrew Jerusalem, he come in and took all the vessels out the, the articles of furniture out of the temple and brought them back to Babylon. And they have brought these vessels of the house of his house before you, and you and your lords, your wives, your concubines have drunk wines from wine from them. Noted that the only ones who were to use the vessels from God's house, the temple there in Jerusalem, were that of the priests, the Levites, those who were appointed, those who God had ordained, sanctified for that particular work. Here we see that this individual, not really understanding that, but took those things from which was meant for worship of the one true God, and now he uses them, as Daniel says, that you have drunk wine from them, and you have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone, which do not see or know that they are just exactly that, nothing. They're gold and silver, wood and stone, bronze and iron, just material things. Nothing that has any life within them. Nothing that can truly give life. Nothing that we see that when we read throughout the scripture about idolatry and idols, that we note today that you have this man who was not an ignorant man. Uh, he, was, he wasn't there because he was certainly ignorant, but he was certainly an intelligent soul. But what we see is that they would look to honor these idols. Now today, and that's where I want to turn my attention when we talk about idols, Darius, or excuse me, Belshazzar himself would not humble himself before the true God, even though he knew that there was a true God who had operated in the past on behalf of his family. But he would continue to engage in idolatry. So he would take these things from the house of God, the one true God, and he would use them in some type of idolatrous worship. He would use those vessels that were meant to be truly for worship of God, the true God alone, and he would use them to praise the gods of gold and silver, of bronze and iron, and of wood and stone. 
God would bring about that of his judgment upon Belshazzar for these things. I want us to pause this morning and I want us to think along that line because you and I, that when we talk about like idolatry, we would say, well, you know, people are smarter than that now. We, we know that, yes, that there is a one true only God that is in heaven who made everything because it's very clear that this world of which we live in, it has, somebody had to put it together. It just couldn't be by this random chance. Paul tells us that in the book of Romans, right? When we read there in chapter 1, he said that God's, it, it's, it's very evident, it's very clear that there is a God in the world. Creation speaks that there is a God. And we would say, yes, there is a God. So we would know that all these other things, that yes, those people were foolish when they would worship these idols of silver and gold and bronze and iron and wood and stone. And that was an ongoing theme when we talk about the worship of these idols throughout the Old Testament, right? We, we see that, that God warned his people over and over in the Old Testament about idolatry. Don't engage, because noted when we look at the Ten Commandments, right? That is one of the Ten Commandments. Don't make any graven image. Don't make any carved image that you would bow down to it and worship it as God, right? So we see that when we talk about the warnings of this, it continues on and on and on throughout the, the entire Old Testament. Idolatry. Worshiping these false gods that people have, have made. Habakkuk, in the second chapter, it tells us that Habakkuk says this in, in chapter 2, verse 18. He says, what profit is the image that the maker, that its maker should carve it? So you as, the, you as a human being, that you would carve out this image, whether it would be of, of wood or stone or, or bronze or iron or gold or silver, you would, you would make this image. You yourself would make the image, and then you would bow down to it. Makes no sense. You made the God, this idol, this representation, I suppose, of the God, and you would bow down to it. Habakkuk says, what is the profit in the image that its maker should carve it? The mold in the image, a teacher of lies, he says, that the maker of its mold should trust in it to make mute idols. Woe to him who says to wood, awake, to silent stone, arise, it shall teach. Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, yet in it there is no breath at all. None. And we would understand that today, right? That wouldn't be anything for us. Now, we do understand that we go around this world that people still do worship idols, statuary. We see it today. You know, as my son had when he had gone to, to Nepal and, and, and Kale, when she had come back, they let me know, yeah, they're still bowing down. They're still presenting stuff to these idols out in the streets. They've got them set up in the streets, and you can go and put fruit before them. You can, if you need wealth or health or whatever the case is going to be, whatever that particular God is for, that you can bring it what, what is supposedly what they would want from you to receive this benefit or this blessing from them. So people still do that. They, they still fall down to this statuary, these, these things of which man is made. And you say, well, you know, that's, that's them folks over there. They're, they're not, you know, enlightened as us Westerners, right? Well, it happens in, 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 in the Western culture as well. Uh, last year when I was over in Poland and, and got to tour some of the, the, the churches, the buildings that were there, and, and went into some of these massive cathedrals that have, are, are centuries old, some were older than, than our nation, and, and they've got these huge statues of, of Mary and, and other saints, supposed, that they actually worship. That they bring in different things and, and, and cast money or, or, or take the time to bow down before it on certain days. And, and I'm sitting there thinking, you've got to be kidding me. 
knowing that the scripture itself is clear, but you still have people in the Western world that are bowing down to these statues. That these things that God have made, these representations of the supposed uh, personage of, of Mary or one of the other saints. But it happens. And just like Habakkuk said, what prophet is the image? What does it do? There's nothing truly that when we think about in the image itself that is going to do anything for you. But people will still bow down to it. Isaiah, in his writing, he, he would be very clear about the whole situation in chapter 44. Isaiah chapter 44, looking at verse, uh, verse 9, when he speaks about the foolishness of idolatry. He says, those who make an image, all of them are useless. And their precious things shall not profit. They are their own witnesses. They neither see nor know that they may be ashamed. Who would form a God or mold an image that profits him nothing? And that's what they're looking. Who would do that? So they're thinking that they are going to profit from making these images. He goes on. Surely all his companions would be ashamed and the workmen, <clears throat> they were mere men. Let them all be gathered together, let them stand up, yet they shall fear, they shall be ashamed together. The blacksmith with his tongs works one in the coals, fashions it with a hammer, and works it with the strength of his arms. Even so, he is hungry and his strength fails, he drinks no water and is faint. You've got this individual who's working a, a metallurgist and he's work, work, working to mold some kind of image in the fire by his own strength. And he'll himself, he'll, he'll faint in the process because of the, of the heat of it. The craftsman stretches out his rule. He marks one with, with chalk. He fashions it with a plane. He marks it out with a compass. Makes it the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man, that it may remain in his house. You've got this individual who, not a, a metallurgist, someone who's working with, with certain metals, gold, silver, iron, brass, whatever the case may be, but a guy who takes wood and able to fashion into some kind of uh, an image of man, it says. He cuts down cedars for himself. So the same wood of which, as Isaiah says here, the same wood of which the, the man himself would carve these images out and bow down to it, he says he takes the cedars and the oak, he secures it for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants a pine and rain nourishes it. You got these things that just naturally grow up. And he takes this, and then it shall be for a man to burn, for he will take some of it and warm himself. So he's going to use it, this what just grows naturally. He's going to take some of it, he's going to throw it in the fire so he can be warm. Then it says, and he kindles it, and he bakes bread, and so he's going to use not only some of it to keep himself warm, but then he's going to use some of it to cook with, the same wood. And then he says, and then, indeed, he makes a god and worships it. He makes a carved image, and he falls down to it. He burns half of it in the fire. With half he eats meat, he roasts to roast and is satisfied. He even warms himself and says, ah, I am warm. I have seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god, his carved image, and he falls down before it and worships it, prays to it and says, deliver me for you are my God. Foolishness, right? I, I would hope we all here today would say that is so foolish. Then we would go out here, cut a tree down, and then we would use part of it to keep ourselves warm with, part of it we would use to cook with, and then what was left over, we would carve out a God for ourselves, and we would bow down to that same God of which we have burnt part of it up, of which this God was made from. That's just foolishness. And then, as Isaiah says, he says, they do not know nor understand. For he has shut their eyes so that they cannot see. God himself, that's what he says, he shut their eyes. That they cannot see. And their hearts so they cannot understand. And no one considers in his heart, nor is there knowledge, nor understanding to say, I have burned half of it in a fire. Yes, I also bake bread on its coals. I have roasted meat and eaten it. And I shall make the rest of it, and what? An abomination. 
Shall I fall down before a block of wood? He feeds on ashes. A deceived heart has turned him aside, and he shall not deliver his soul, nor say, is there not a lie in my right hand? And I, I would hope we would all agree today that we're like, hey, you know, that's, that, that's, that's not us today. You know, that's those folks back there in the Old Testament. You know, that, that's where they were at. And I know there are some people out in this world. But no, we, we understand that this, we talk about idolatry. You know, that's not us. We don't bow down to those things. It's not who we are. We don't do that. We know that there's one true God. That's the God we serve. That's the God we're looking to honor. Him alone shall we worship, right? That's what we're going to do. Well, we, we look again, and, and as we see, as, as God unfolds this whole idea of idolatry, just like he did with Belshazzar when he talked about Belshazzar, that he would not humble himself before God, and he would do these things that were contrary against God. He said, you've lifted yourself up against God. And noted that, that we see people doing that. They, they, again, may not bow down to a certain idol, but they would take it upon themselves to lift them up. up. They would lift themselves up against God. What does, what does Samuel tell us in 1 Samuel chapter 15? Well, Samuel says this when he's dealing with, king, with then King Saul. Because God had appointed Saul to be king of Israel, but we know that Saul, instead of trusting in the Lord, that he would not trust in God, but he would look to trust in himself. He would not look at God's order of things, but he would do what he wanted to do. That's what we see here in this, in this verse, 1 Samuel chapter 15 Looking at verse uh, 22, Samuel said, Has the Lord <clears throat> as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? So what had happened is in, with Israel and, and here specifically with Saul, that it was not Saul's place to offer the offering. That was Samuel's place. Saul got impatient. He offered up the, the burnt offering to the Lord along with not doing exactly what God had said for him to do, which was destroy all of those uh, individuals of which he had, just, uh, he had just fought. But he kept Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive and then brought some of the livestock back with him. Samuel is like, God has no, no he's not pleased with with this idea of these burnt offerings and sacrifices in a way that has not been prescribed by him. It's better to obey. That's what he tells Saul as obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed, surrendering, to listen, to do, than the fat of rams. In verse 23, for rebellion, he says, is as the sin of witchcraft. Listen. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. So going back to Belshazzar, what did, what did Daniel say to him? He said, he said, you have not humbled yourself, right? And you have lifted yourself up against God. We note that he had taken and praised God with all the, all the vessels of the house of God, all these other gods of, of, of silver and gold and such. And here we've got Saul, who would take it upon himself not to obey God, that he would not humble himself to be patient and wait upon the Lord, but we see that he was stubborn in that way, and we see that as stubbornness is iniquity and idolatry, what? Because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He said, that's like idolatry. 
think for a minute now. Think for a minute. When we talk about idolatry and that, that whole, because all the times we think about idols, we think about that statuary and those things that people bow down to, and we would all say, no, no, no. Don't have none of that kind of stuff in my house. We don't play that. We don't play that. We don't play that here in our church. We don't play that. But Samuel says, stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry because you've rejected the word of the Lord. You've lifted yourself up against God. You've not humbled yourself before God. You've lifted yourself up against God and God's saying that's like idolatry because you've rejected what God has said and you've followed a different path. Ezekiel says this. I know I'm using a lot here in the Old Testament, but helping everybody to uh, find our way through the Old Testament again this morning. Ezekiel says this in chapter 12. Looking at, at verse, uh, verse 1, he says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, he says, you dwell, verse 2, Son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house. Going back again to what Samuel had told Saul, he said, you, you've rebelled. It's like witchcraft. You've rebelled against God. It's like witchcraft when you do this. He says, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house, and meaning Judah, which has eyes to see, but does not see, and ears to hear, but does not hear, for they are a rebellious house. They themselves, that they've got, not like idols that have these eyes that are made, but can't see anything, ears, but can hear. But God is saying, these people, they've got eyes to see, and they've got ears to hear what God is saying, but they rebel against him. They rebel against that of the things of God. Now, when we bring this back up, when we, when we look at, at what's going on here today, and we see the, uh, as Daniel, again, would lay it before that of Belshazzar, and throughout the Old Testament, we have God warning against idolatry. I, I didn't make it my, my study on this to see if, if every book of the Old Testament had something to do with idolatry, but you can best believe in the underpinnings of it that, that it probably does, that you could find idolatry somewhere because people would lift themselves up against God, that they would themselves become some kind of God. Now, I want us to think today to, to bring, to start, I'll say this, to start to bring this to a close. What if, what if we, when we think along this line, and noted, it not, it's not that any of us are going to go home today and, and bow before any little statues. We, we don't have anything like that that we're going to give any kind of homage to. But, but have we, in some way, we speak about being, being rebellious or, or putting idolatry into our lives, because when we come into the New Testament, over and over and over again, there are, there's warning after warning after warning about idolatry. Matter of fact, at the Jerusalem Council, that was the one of the things of which the Gentiles themselves had to be aware of. Not to eat anything that was, uh, had been given over to idols. Don't get involved in that. But I ask us today, when we think along the lines, is there's been something that has come about that started to replace God in our lives. We use it as an idol. One of the things today, because I, I loved ancient history, I loved that of like ancient Rome and Egypt, and that was one of my focuses during my college years. And one thing that I did understand and come to understand about Rome and that was always going on, especially as it started to digress, that one of the things that we see that the, 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 the emperors kept the people occupied with was was entertainment. 
They, they, they kept, with, with all that was going on in the, in the empire of Rome to keep the people satisfied, he kept them entertained. He would build the Colosseum. And he would have these, these sports events and, and plays and, and many different things. They flooded that place one time to reenact a, a naval battle. But it kept the people entertained. It kept their thoughts away from all that was going on in the rest of the empire. And it, the focus was, we'll keep them entertained. Built the Colosseum. And with that, that we see when we talk along the lines that, that it, it just distracted them. Today, in, in a, in a, in, for us, we see that it's sports. And in sports in and of itself, it's, it's nothing wrong with it. But friends, what happens is, is that we have become, as a people, especially in this age, we have become so enamored with sports figures and those kinds of celebrities. We, we look today that instead of the, 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 the family orienting their, their children, to raise their children in the, in the house of God on a, on, a, on a Lord's day, instead that they think that we will raise our children, that we will go and we'll get them to participate in all these kinds of sports whether it be soccer or field hockey or softball or baseball, will have all these kinds of sports activities that supersede that of what truly matters. Friends, it's only so many kids that are, that are people that are going to make the, the professional realm. But what is really truly going to matter is the character that of their relationship with God that really matters. But what we find is that people have become so consumed with that of, of the sports itself. And again, it, it's nothing wrong with playing soccer. There's nothing wrong with playing field hockey. It's good for kids. I wish more kids would play it instead of sitting home and playing on their television sets. Get out, get some fresh air. But friends, it's not to replace the worship of God. It's not to replace that of honoring the Lord. And that's what we see, right? When I was coming along, friends, we didn't have organized sports on those Sundays. When I was a kid, didn't happen. Didn't happen. If you had, a, if you had something organized on a Sunday, it's because you and a few friends got together and you decided you were going to kick the ball around or, or shoot some hoops. That was about it. But when it comes to things like Little League or all this other kind of stuff, no. Sunday was set aside for that of what it was meant to be, a day of rest, a day of worship and honoring of the Lord. But today we see that people are always gone. Instead of having their children in the house of the Lord. And for some friends, they've become so consumed with sports, even as adults, that when certain seasons lock in, the church goes to the wayside, and then they roll right with whatever the, the latest sport is that they're engaged in. Just as it was when we speak about in ancient Rome, friends, let's just distract them. Let's give them all they can to distract from actually what's going on, just keep them entertained. Uh, Tozer had written a book about the, the uh, entertainment in the church. It, it was a good book because, see, that kind of stuff, eventually we talk about entertaining the masses as far as the culture itself, keeping them entertained. It eventually trickles into the body of Christ, into the church. So instead of putting on a worship service that will honor God and lift Him up and magnify Him, what happens is, is that we just want to bring people in, we'll entertain them. We'll, we'll do, we'll, we'll put things on that will attract, is, attract people. We'll entertain them. We'll become, is what I used to like to call the circus church. We'll have a three ring circus going on and just keep everybody attracted 
to all the entertainment that's up on the stage. And that's not what church is all about. So we see that people can, they can engage in things like sports, which I would note that, friends, it's nothing wrong in and of itself. But when it comes to replacing who God is in your life, in the life of your family, can't happen. Second thing that we see that people find themselves uh, as, as their God, that we, we, we know that the government can be. Not in the history of our country, we had so many people that's dependent upon the government. And it's not to be. Friends, we, we don't, as a people, as an American people, friends, it, it, it was never, I, I would say never, the idea of our founding fathers that the people were to be trusting in government to sustain them and keep them. Never their thought. Government itself was to be limited because they understood the power of government. They come from a, a tyrannical system before. And they certainly didn't want to have government being that having that kind of power over people anymore. But now what's happened is that we see very clearly that people have become... Uh, they, they have come to a place where they are dependent on the government. And it's become their God. If something were to happen to government, friends, I, some of these people would actually lose their minds. If there would be a collapse of government and, the, and how they are dependent upon that of what the government would give to them day in and day out, they, they would completely lose their minds. I believe that. Because they were so dependent upon that God in their lives. And that's what we see. Never in the history of our country, friends, have we had so many people that are depending upon the government to live. And it was never intended that way. And what we see when that happens, when we start to depend upon something more than God, then what will happen is that that will, that will shift our way of thinking when we think about the, the things that we uphold, the principles, the standards, the morals of which you and I would cling to, but then you have that there will be those that will say, well, if I put those in power, I may lose some of what is, is that I, as far as what's keeping me afloat here. We think about things like abortion. It shouldn't be, folks. Thankfully, there's been a shift far, far what's going on in our world today, as far as what the Supreme Court did to uh, uh, the, the Roe case. But understanding, folks, that, that people are so dependent now that that transforms in how they would even vote for another. And it shouldn't be. Third thing is that when we talk about religion, religion has become, believe it or not, a God, just not to worship God and honor God, but religion itself has become a God. People think that because they are religious, that that will sustain them, that will keep them. You have all kinds of people today that, are, that, that would claim to be spiritual or religious. They claim to have some kind of faith. But see, they have faith in their faith. They don't have faith in God. They don't have faith in Jesus Christ. They have faith in a faith, whether it be Catholicism or even Protestantism or in a particular church or in some kind of the multitude of other spiritualities that are out in this world today, they have this kind of, of image of religion that has become their God, and it is not the true God, and it's idolatry. It has replaced the worship of the one true living God. We see it, folks. We see it all the time. It doesn't take any, any rocket scientist when you turn the television on and look at what, what they, the emphasis is in, in, the, in the church. Which leads me to my next point is money and wealth. 
That has become an emphasis within the, in the church at large today. What did Jesus say? God, that, that you cannot serve God and mammon. There, there's a, a straight difference because if you make money, wealth, all that your God, then, then friends, there is no way you can serve one or the other. You can't serve two masters. For you will learn to hate one and love the other and love one and hate the other. It's just ha- It is. It is what it is. And we find that these many different things infiltrate our lives. And, and we, it, they, they may have crept in. They may have crept in unnoticed. That we've allowed certain aspects of life, entertainment, sports, television, the internet... And, and it's, I, I check myself up because even things like this, right? It beca- it we, the first thing, first thing in the morning that I grab is that. Right off the bat, I grab that, make sure it charged through the night, make sure I, I've got plenty of power for the day. But see, for some, it becomes our God. It becomes our God. We hold on to this more at times than we even do our Bibles. And we've got to beware of all the entertainment that's out there that draws us away from true fellowship with one another and fellowship, most importantly, with the Lord. We've got to watch ourselves, friends, when it comes to that of our trusting in the government. Because remember, folks, we're, we're very thankful. We're blessed people in this nation. I, I think, again, that we, this is one of the greatest nations that the world has ever, ever seen. But remember, folks, God didn't make a covenant with the United States of America. He didn't do that. He made a covenant with the nation of Israel. He didn't make a covenant with the United States. If we've been blessed by God as our foundations on that of the principles of of uh, Judeo-Christian principles, sure. But understanding, just as we see with Israel and how God himself, when they went away from him, what he did with them. And friends, we as a people are not above that. We as the people are not above that. And that's why we see that there was so much activity in the civil life when we talk about our early foundations of preachers and godly men, because they understood that when we talk about this republic of which we have, if it's not governed by godly people, if it's not lived out in a godly way, it'll collapse. And then we look and see that religion today, people themselves, they just think because they're religious, because they've made a god out of their particular religion, whatever it may be. Some people can come to a church like this that we, we would believe were Bible-believing, just kind of fundamental, just kind of straightforward simplicity of the gospel. But some people would believe just because they're a part of something like that, that that's enough. Not even having a relationship with Jesus Christ, just as long as they're a part of a church like that. And it becomes their God. And then lastly, that spoke on enough when we speak about just money and wealth. There are many people out here today, and that's why the Lord himself had said that when we speak about the rich, he said it's difficult for the rich to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And why was it? Because they trusted in their riches. They trusted in their riches. The New Testament today. One of the last things, and this is what we'll we'll bring to a close as we come to the end of the New Testament and and throughout the New Testament there's warnings over and over and over again about idolatry and in the last verse of 1 John chapter 5 last verse verse 21 let's look at the, the, the whole context he says verse 18 We know, listen, we know, we we know, the church, we know what John's saying. 
we know that whoever is born of God does not sin. Meaning he doesn't practice. He, she doesn't practice sinning anymore. Because if you go back, you say, well, I must not be, be saved. Go back to what John had started with. It's not, it's not going to be an exposition on this. But understand that as born-again believers, we do not practice sinning. We don't practice idolatry. We walk according to the Spirit, not according to the flesh. He says, we know that whoever is born of God does not sin. But he who has been born of God, what does he do? He keeps himself. He reigns himself in. He watches what he does. He examines himself. He notes the, the roads of which he is traveling. He watches his character. He understands that of what is right to do and what is wrong to do. He says, and the wicked one does not touch him. We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. We know that. We see the evidence of that daily. We see that all the time, that the whole world lies under that sway of the devil. And he says, and we know that the Son of God has come and He has given us an understanding that we may know Him who is true. Not like idols. Not like these things that can't speak or do anything for you. Things that we've made with our own hands. That of human devising. When we speak about that, of, of all the entertainment, the, the, the things when we speak about corrupt in, corruption in government, and, and we speak about religions in a negative way, and, and how money itself, the love of it is the root of all evil. We know these things. But we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know Him who is true, that God has opened your eyes and my eyes to the truth of the gospel that Jesus saves. There's no other Savior apart from Jesus Christ. There's no other God apart from Him. He is the hope of our, our entire being. He is our all in all. And we, He says, are in Him who is true that we have this understanding, we've embraced the gospel, and that we are in Him who is true, in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the what? True God and eternal life. Jesus Christ is eternal life for you. There is no other life apart from Jesus Christ. There is no eternal life apart from Jesus Christ. There is only one true God. And he showed himself in the person, that second person of the Trinity, in that of Jesus Christ. One who has loved you and gave himself for you. See, that's, that's the God of which we serve. A God who is not a dead God. A God who is just not of, of silver and gold, of, of, of wood and stone, or, or bronze and iron. But a God who is a person, alive and well, has emotion, feeling, has power to the, to the just extreme, and is able to embrace you. A sinner, someone who is rebellious, who's able to bring you in because he loves you. He cares about his creation. He cares about you. And he says that this is the true God and eternal life. And what does he close there? What does John the, the apostle of love. What does he, he close with in that 21st verse? He says, little children. His closing words with all that John had said about the Antichrist and all these other things, about the love of God, he closes this letter by saying, little children, keep yourself from idols. Amen. Keep yourself away from idols. Don't let anything replace the one true God and eternal life. Keep yourself away.
from those things. Don't let anything, friends, replace what you have in the person of Jesus Christ. Because all other things will vanish away. When we speak about all that we have in this world, all the wealth, homes, all the things we could name, all those things that the Bible says, heaven and earth, it'll pass away. But what does God say? My word will by no means pass away. What I have promised you, you can keep into eternal life. And Jesus says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe on him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Heaven and earth can pass away, friends. But what God has promised, the one true God and eternal life will stand forever. Let's pray together.